Good morning and welcome to you all and welcome to those who are joining us online this morning. It's a really wonderful feeling this time of drawing nearer to Christ's birth, the time we celebrate that time. I just invite you to join with me in the responsive welcome as up on the up on the board. Peace loving and peace giving God, you bless us with your unfailing and unconditional love. We come to worship and praise our loving God and rejoice in God's tender mercy towards us. Generous God, you pour blessings and grace upon us, forgiving us for our sin and shame. We come to worship and honour our merciful God and rejoice in the wonder of forgiven and forgotten sin. Holy God, in the beauty of your shalom and in the glory of your presence, all barriers are lowered. We come to worship and revere our glorious God who enriches the lives of God's own people and speaks peace into the hearts of all faithful people. Amen. Let's pray. Loving and living Lord, as we welcome you into our midst, we call upon you to bless this time that we may know your blessing and you may know our devotion, that you may know your presence and you, and you may know our worship, that we may know your will and you may know our willingness, that we, we may know you in the silence and you, you may know us in our praise. Amen. Duke. 
For the day is taken from Psalm 85, verses 1 to 2, and then from 8 to 13. You, Lord, showed favour to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Here ends the psalm. reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. 
Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service, service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. The next reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 15a. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. That was the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, okay. Right, okay, so let's get started. Shall we open with prayer? Lord God and Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for Jesus Christ. We do give you thanks that he came to save us, save us from our sins, to pay the penalty and to wash us clean of guilt. We pray, Lord, that we might remember this daily as we head towards the celebration of the day of his birth. And we pray, Lord, that as we do this, others might see you in us and that, that we might be a witness, not only with our words, but also with our actions for what you have done. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if you remember, but the last time <coughs> I presented a message was in early November. The theme for that message was avoiding the other place. In short, this involved knowing that God's work, that God works in us to will and to act according to his purpose. That is, in the first place, we need to choose to fear the Lord, to walk in his ways and to serve only him. So we looked at the challenge that Joshua gave Israel and the choice that he had made that he declared. As for me and my house, we will uh, serve the Lord. And the second thing was to confirm this choice by our actions. This comes down to obeying his commands. And I think uh, Jesus' commands boil down to one thing, 
and that is to love Christ as he loved us or to love others as Jesus loved us. So today's message has a similar theme, but it comes from the opposite direction. Rather than avoiding the other place, today we will look to the scriptures to find out how we can begin to prepare ourselves for the future with Christ in, the pres- in his presence forever. So let me begin with an illustration. I enjoy taking photographs. And one of my great ambitions is to take a photograph that shows a series of tears, layers of hills or of headlands or of mountains. The aim is to take a photo showing this series. Each layer overlaps the uh, one that comes after and each successive layer becomes less distinct. The haze of distance of mist or of rain makes each layer less discernible than the one previously. I've had a go at this ambition a number of times, but I've yet to achieve the hero shot that I'm hoping for. So here are a couple of my better examples. So the first one, this one's in New Zealand. So you can see that successive layers of hills are fading into the background. Another one I've tried up in the Blue Mountains. This layer upon layer of the hills that are up there with those sandstone caps and the shale undercutting, just layer upon layer, each one becoming less and less distinct. And finally, there was one I took in New Zealand when we were in doubtful sound. It was raining so hard then and the wind was blowing so ferociously that even waterfalls were flowing upwards. But it meant that each of those layers there, you could see the layers as they went through. So in each of these photos, the eye is immediately drawn uh, to the darkest layer in the foreground. Then it shifts step by step backwards, layer by layer, until nothing more can be seen. And today's Bible passages, I reckon, are like this. They are linked by the theme of preparing for the future. Rather than becoming more obscure as you look at each passage, uh, subsequent passages build on the previous one, uh, becoming increasingly clear. So let's begin by looking at the Old Testament reading uh, in Isaiah 40. Isaiah was, of course, one of the Old Testament prophets. His message was to the people of Judah, uh, those tribes of Israel that lived in the southern part of Israel with Ju- uh, Jerusalem as their most important city, city. Isaiah's message was about God's judgment and his salvation. As a result of their rebellion, Judah was, being, was to be punished by being sent into exile in Babylon. It was far away from hearth and home and where by the waters of Babylon they sat down and wept when they remembered Zion. It wasn't a happy time. Israel, led by its king, rebelled against God's rule and did things their own way. This rebellion was punished. The tribes of Judah were taken away from their homeland and carted off to exile in Babylon. They were separated from all that they held dear. There was nothing they could do to end this exile. But God, in his grace and mercy, made provision for their return to Jerusalem, to Israel, to the land promised to their ancestors who believed God. Isaiah is told to comfort God's people. And I think there are three comforts that Isaiah is to reveal to them. First one, hard times will come upon them. They will be punished for their sins and rebellion. They will be judged. But the judgment will be exiled into Babylon. But the time of exile will be finite. It will come to an end. Their hard service will be completed. The second comfort is that Israel's sin 
has been paid for. The punishment has been sufficient to atone for their rebellion and their sin against heaven. And the third comfort is that they will receive from the Lord, from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. They are being promised that things will be much better after the price of sin has been paid than it was before. Life will be better after the return from exile than it was before they left. This first voice is tender and is a voice of comfort. Comfort that God will act. Why then should Judah be comforted by these words? Why should they believe them? After all, words are only words. How can Isaiah back them up? Isaiah gives three reasons or signs for them to believe that what he, what he says will come to pass. So the first sign will be a voice calling. This call will be for action to take place in the desert, in the wilderness. This is remarkable because usually important change happens in the cities, the seats of power. The desert, well, no one lives there. How could anything good come from this place? How could this be the place that prepares the way for the Lord? If the location is remarkable, then so is the message. Isaiah gives three pointers to God's acting. The first one, prepare the way for the Lord. Who is to prepare the way of the Lord? It's not the messenger. He's telling someone else to do it. The messenger will tell the people to prepare the way of the Lord. How will they do this? They will fear the Lord and walk, walk in his ways. Make straight in the wilderness is the second pointer. Make it straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. What sort of road would it be? It will be a spiritual superhighway. It will be straight. There will be no side tracks, no alternative routes, no interchanges to distract or divert people from the way, uh, from the people of God, from the way of the Lord. Those who travel this highway will not deviate from the Lord's commands. The third pointer, raise up valleys, make every mountain low, make every rough patch level. On this highway there will be no mountainous hairpins on which to come unstuck and no deep valleys that may flood and become impassable. To walk in God's ways, to obey his commands, smooths out the way and will free the traveller from the highs and lows that inevitably come when they try to do things their own way, following their own wisdom. This highway will allow the confidence of faith to thrive without distraction or deviation. Together, these three pointers declare that the glory of the Lord is to be revealed. More than that, when the glory of the Lord is revealed, all mankind together will see it. God's glory won't be a secret. It won't be hidden. Everyone will know it. No one will miss it. This second voice calls out, prepare the way of the Lord. Walk in his ways. The second sign. Isaiah was told to cry out. What shall I cry, he answers. He is told that all humankind is like grass. Their glory is like the flowers of the field. Their greatest achievements seem bright and optimistic, wonderful to behold, like a garden planted with pansies, marigolds, daisies and the like. But just as a garden withers and the flowers fades, so does man's glory. It is here one minute, gone the next. Just as the wind blows on the grass and the flowers and they fade, so too do the achievements of men wither and fade when held up against God's majesty, his holiness and his righteousness. It seems to me that when Isaiah proclaimed the message of the voice crying in the desert, the response would have been, I can't do that. I can't make a superhighway. It is beyond my capacity. 
my skills, my determination. If God is asking me to prepare the way of the Lord, then I can't do it. Is there no hope? It is undoubtedly beyond the capacities of men to do this. A quick look at the history of the world from Adam and Eve right up till this time and beyond up to our time here today confirms that there is no one who can measure up to this standard. But Isaiah does offer hope. Uh, a certain expectation that God will act and he will do it. He tells them, despite man being frail like grass and ephemeral like the flowers, the word of our God stands forever. God's words are true and his promises never expire. God's word can be relied upon, depended upon, and will remain unchanging forever. If God says his glory will be revealed with those three pointers, then it will be revealed, and with his glory, salvation will come. This third voice is a voice of despair. How can I do it? But God's response is, don't worry, I've got it under control. My word stands forever. So the third sign, there will be a shout from the mountaintops. Here is your God. With this shout, he, Jesus, will come. He is the sovereign Lord and he will come with power. His arm rules for him. His arm is mighty and he will rule with power. His will will be done. Nothing or no one is going to prevent the Lord from doing what he has purposed. No one will be able to stand against him. He will bring his reward with him and his reward are those who have been rescued from exile. But this strength and power is balanced with care and gentleness. A sovereign king is also like a shepherd who cares for his flock, who gathers the lambs in his arms and holds them close to his heart. What a wonderful image. We are all like lambs who have gone astray, and here is the sovereign, sovereign Lord, the shepherd king, who cares for his sheep. Sheep that will never be rejected, never abandoned, and can rest in his arms or be gently led. This fourth voice is a shout of triumph. Here is your God. He is the sovereign Lord who cares for his people. Now, did you notice this passage is a very vocal one? Lots of speech is coming out. And I'd suggest that how are we to prepare to the, uh, to the future? We should listen to the voices. We're not crazy if we do that, but we're wise. And what do the voices tell us? First one, the tender speech, offering comfort, comfort to those who are lost. You have a voice calling for us to walk in God's ways. There is a cry of despair telling us of our inability to save ourselves, but also telling us that God's words, his promises are true and endure forever. And then there is the shout of good tidings that God has acted and he will keep his promises. And the good news is, the good news is, here is your God. He alone has power to rescue his people and to care for them. That's all the first here. Let's move on to the second one. So there's much to be heard in that first here. Uh, but as our eyes are drawn to the second tier, so things become clearer. The second tier is revealed in the Gospel reading for today from Mark's Gospel, Chapter 1. Just while they're there, one comment that I read was that Mark's Gospel has been named poorly. It's not Mark's Gospel. It's the Gospel about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God which is a bit of a different perspective, isn't it, as told by Mark. 
So, the link between the first tier and the second one is clear. The prophecy we just looked at in Isaiah is quoted here in Mark. And they're a little bit different. But I think the differences between the two points to man's inability to save himself, his inability to prepare the way, his inability to walk in God's ways, and his inability to serve him. Someone else must do it for him. And this messenger that is, that is taught, told about is given this task. But his message is the same as Isaiah's. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This messenger is identified as John the Baptist. Not only was he a voice calling from the desert, but he also had the appearance of a prophet. Camel hair clothing, a leather belt, and a diet of locusts and wild honey. Obviously a job to be desired. And it's likely that the only reason that anyone would listen to a man like this was that he was proclaiming the truth. And the truth drew sinners and the lost to him for comfort. What was John's message? Repentance. Repentance is turning back from going the wrong way, the way that promotes our self-importance, and rather turning towards the Lord to walk in his ways, which is essentially the same message that was in Isaiah. How do you prepare the way for the Lord? You repent and you walk in God's ways. So those who heard this message were crying out in despair. They cannot save themselves. They cannot make things right between themselves and God. Someone must do it for them. All John can do is to call on them to repent for the forgiveness of sins and then mark them with water, which is baptism. Recognising that they have repented and have been forgiven, that they desire to serve the Lord with all their heart. But then John takes this message th further. He is only the forerunner of one who is to come. Someone more powerful than he will come after John. This someone, yes, we know that it's Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. But this someone will be more powerful than John, will be so much greater than John that John is unworthy to stoop before him to untie his sandals. That is the action of a servant, and yet John considers himself to be less worthy than that. And this someone will have a baptism that won't be like John's with water and will be external, but he will baptise, will mark as his own with the Holy Spirit who will dwell in us. And this mark will show in every thought, in every word and in every action. The second tier points to Jesus' first coming, his advent in human form to do what men and women cannot do for themselves. Jesus came to show the way to God the Father. The consequences of sin, which is death, no longer need burden us for the hard service of sin. There's yes, Satan is a hard taskmaster. The hard service of sin has been completed, finished. Jesus came to pay the penalty for sin and open up the way to the Father, where once we were far from God, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are now able to draw near the throne of grace and not be turned away. Jesus came so that we may receive double from the Lord's hand. Not only are our, are our transgressions, rebellions, misdeeds and sin dealt with, but we have even greater blessings. We all are adopted as sons, as children of God. We who were once rebels and alienated from God are now his sons and daughters, alongside Jesus and co-heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God. This has to be the greatest rags to riches story ever told. The second tear reveals to us that Jesus is the Lord, the one whom prophecy points to. 
the one who will bring our salvation to reality. The third tier is a little bit different. The second tier has already come to pass. Jesus has lived, died, been raised from the dead and has ascended into heaven. The third tier tells more of what will happen when the shout from the mountaintop comes. Here is your God. This tells about the second coming of Christ. Jesus is the sovereign Lord who will come with power. It is he who will rule with unmatched strength. It is he who will care for his people tenderly and they will join him when he returns. Peter in this letter, letter clarifies Jesus coming in power. First off, when will Jesus' second coming happen? Peter doesn't know. No one knows but the Father. But there are a couple of things to remember. God works in a different time frame to us. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. God is not s slow in keeping his promises, even though we might think it. His timing is perfect. God has a different attitude to us. We like things to happen right now. In fact, I'm sure we'd prefer it that they happened yesterday. But God is not only patient, not only want, not wanting any to perish, perish, but everyone to come to repentance, to turn away from their own ways and turn towards God. What will happen? When Jesus does return, what will it be like? Peter tells us that Jesus' return will be unexpected. It will be a surprise for everyone and only those who are prepared will not be taken unawares. Remember the parable of the foolish ten, the ten virgins and the five foolish ones who weren't prepared. It will be dramatic. No one will miss it. The heavens will disappear. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Creation that was once corrupted by sin, by the sin of Adam and Eve, will be destroyed. Nothing will be left. But in keeping with his promise, we can look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And that is where those who have been called by Jesus and clothed with his righteousness will reside with Jesus and in the presence of God. How will his people be recognised? And I've now got a problem that I've missed by the last page. Oh, here we go. Jesus' people, uh, those who belong in the home of righteousness, will be aspire to be like Christ. They will lead holy and godly lives. Their lives will be pure and they will walk in God's ways. They will make every effort to be spotless, to live a life that others can rec recognise as honouring God. They are to be blameless, to live a life that they believe honours God and is, and is true to him. And with that, they will be at peace with him. Having been rescued and restored by Christ, we are at peace with God. We are at peace with him because he is on our side. And the double blessing is, is that we can be at peace with others. This third tier, although clarifying the second coming of Christ, also brings us back to where we began. The way of the Lord is prepared when his people, the sheep of his hand, walk in the Lord's way. This is only possible through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Spirit, and the unmerited favour of God the Father. By looking at these passages as tears, each one adding to and clarifying the one that came before, we can see that God's plan for our salvation is not some spur of the moment or idea or off-the-cuff solution. It has been in God's mind since before men and women were kicked out of Eden. And since then, through the scriptures, God's plan of salvation has gradually been revealed, coming to a climax with Jesus, the glory of the Lord, who was revealed when he walked the earth 
and all, man, and all mankind together will see him return as the sovereign Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we do pray that you might dwell within us and that you might direct our paths even though we might be tempted time and again to move in another direction. We pray, Lord, that you might prepare us for your return and that we can look forward to it with hope and joy. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. bringing light to our darkness. We're called to go into the world confident in God's loving presence to serve others in need. So go, bringing hope and peace to this darkened world. God's love and his blessings be upon you. Amen.